morning, I want, by God's help, I want to be an encouragement to you today. Um, it's amazing, even through the song service and, and what's been said already here. Can I just give you this statement? No matter what's going on in your life, you can trust God. I don't know most of you here this morning. I don't know what's going on in your life today. But can I tell you, no matter what's going on, no matter how bad things may get, you can trust God. And today in our story, in Genesis chapter 22, it's going to be a very familiar story uh, that many of you have heard many times. But I hope today that you will receive some kind of nugget today that will be something maybe that you haven't thought about, something that will be an encouragement to you and to your heart uh, today. As a former athlete, and may I remind you, not much of one, I love sporting events. Uh, we had a good time yesterday at David and Leah's, and um, we, we knew exactly what time the Alabama football game came on, and so we planned everything around the Alabama football game. And, uh, and so uh, we were excited about, even though obviously the competition wasn't um, that great yesterday, you know, we played the big college of Mercer. And so, uh, but we, we, we enjoyed watching football together yesterday. I, I love sporting events. I, I love watching my favorite team. I love watching uh, my favorite sports, whether it's basketball, football, or, or baseball, or whatever it may be. I love watching sporting events. As a coach of about 27 years, I just actually officially retired from coaching last year. Uh, it was my last year of coaching. I had been coaching 20-something, 20 20-plus 20 years, almost 27 years. Uh, but I love it when sporting events, when games go into extra innings, or overtime, particularly if I have paid good money to watch a football game. Uh, I, I like to get my money's worth. And so I like it when it goes into extra innings. I like it when it goes into overtime. I, I was sitting down watching Atlanta Braves big base, baseball game the other day, and, uh, and it went down into the bottom of the ninth inning, uh, tied up. Uh, and uh, we had a chance to win at the bottom of the ninth. I'm a Braves fan, and, uh, and we didn't win it. So it went into the tenth inning, and and there in the 10th inning, uh, Peterson uh, had a walk-off single, and we won the game in the bottom of the 10th inning. And, uh, and I love when, when games come down to an exciting time in the bottom of the last inning. I'm reminded a few years ago, uh, being an Alabama fan, and the national championship game in the University of Georgia. Uh, and uh, I remember that game, and, and we were behind, and uh, Jalen Hurts was our quarterback, and uh, he was struggling that game. He was the SEC Offensive Player of the Year that year, and he was struggling that game. And, and all of a sudden, our coach decides to put in a, a quarterback that had not played much. His name was Tua Tungavaloa. Say that fast five times. And Saban put him in, and Tua brought us back and sent us into overtime. And then I will never forget the final play. Georgia had scored. They had kicked a field goal. And it was our turn, so we had to score a field goal to tie it, to send it in double overtime or a touchdown to win it. And I remember fourth and whatever it was, and two, I went back and dropped back as a left-hander at midfield and, and threw a pass to Devontae Smith, and we won the ball game and won the national championship, and you should have seen our household. I mean, we were jumping up and down. We were screaming. We were throwing things. We were excited uh, because it happened the last play of the game. Today from Genesis chapter 22, I want to talk to you about our God in the bottom of the ninth inning. When you're wondering where God is at, can I tell you sometimes when you don't realize if God is there or not, can I tell you our God will always show up at the right timing? And today I want to speak to you on what I've entitled, Our God in the Bottom of the Ninth Inning. You see, bottom of the ninth inning experiences happen in everyday life. We come to that point where we must deliver when the game is on the line. And in our story in Genesis 22 today, God reveals himself in the bottom of the ninth inning as Jehovah Jireh. Our God will provide you know, there's probably not a name that is better known or more referenced in the Old Testament than Jehovah Jireh. Our God provides. And by the way, if you read the Old Testament, I, I did a study many years ago on, uh, on the compound names of God. 
uh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, uh, and those compound names that the Word of God gives to God. And when God uses a compound name, it is usually because God is addressing an issue in our life. And there is something that is going on in somebody's life And God wants to unveil himself in a new and a real way. And today we're going to see God unveil himself in an unusual way. And we're going to see our God, Jehovah Jireh, show up in the bottom of the ninth inning. Look with me in Genesis chapter 22 as we work our way through the story this morning. And I know you guys start at 1015 Uh, I've already been to church once this morning at our church back at Cross Point online. Uh, That was at 9 o'clock. And our second service starts at 11 o'clock. So I'm used to going to like 12 o'clock. All right. And so, uh, but y'all start at 1015, right? Y'all start a little earlier. So I am mindful of that. All right. But let's look at Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2 to get us started. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt or test Abraham. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. In verses 1 and 2, I want you to see, first of all, the crisis of Abraham. The word tempt there in verse 1 is literally the word testing. And God is going to test Abraham through his only son that God had already promised that he was going to make of him a great nation. And now, let's see how much sense this makes. God is going to make of him and his son a great nation. And now God is telling Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac that he loves the most to kill him. Now, how devastating do you think that was for Abraham? God says, Abraham, I'm going to test you today. Uh, Abraham, I'm going to send a test in your life like you've never had. This is what you call an exam, not just a quiz. This is an exam that I'm going to send you today. And so Abraham is tested. And I believe God was telling Abraham, "I I want you to give up the thing that you love the most the thing that you are the most excited about, the thing that was a dream come true in your life when Isaac was born. And I want you to understand, Abraham, this is a test. I believe it was a theological test for Abraham. God had told Abraham, I'm going to make of you and your son a great nation. Isaac was a teenager, not married with no children, I'm sure Abraham was probably thinking, how how are you going to make a great nation through Isaac if he's dead? I'm sure it probably didn't make a lot of sense to Abraham of what God was asking. By the way, have you ever had a theological contradiction when God asked you to do something in your life that did not make sense? Anybody ever had God to ask you to do? God asked you to do something that did not make sense in your mind? Let me see your hand. I know there's got to be more than that. How many of you, God's ever asked you to do something that did not make sense to you? All right, for those that did not raise your hand, you better hang on because that time's coming in all of our lives. It really is. And I want you to notice the crisis of Abraham. First of all, there was a family crisis. I want you to understand Abraham's wife, Sarah, was not even mentioned here in these few verses. There's no record of Abraham telling Sarah about this because I could only imagine if Abraham had told Sarah that what he was going to do, Sarah would have went off. Sarah would have lost her mind. You're going to do what to Isaac? You're going to do what to our only son? You're going to take him where and offer him as a sacrifice? And Sarah would have said, Abraham, you've lost your mind. So it was a family crisis. This was a child that she had waited for for 90 years. And so we had a family crisis, but only was it a family crisis, it was a social crisis. 
I mean, what was everybody going to think about Abraham when Abraham comes down off the mound and Abraham says, yes, God told me to kill my son. Can you imagine what was going through Abraham's mind? What Abraham was thinking? Come on, God, you got to be kidding. You want me to do what? And I believe it was a family crisis. I believe it was a social crisis. But I also believe it was an emotional crisis. Here, God was asking Abraham to give up the thing that he loved the most, the thing that he waited the longest for. God asked him to give it up. It didn't make sense to Abraham. After all, this is the basis for the future. I'm going to make of thee a great nation. And so this was a test that does not make sense. This was a test that seemed unfair. Many of us have been there before. But let me give you the good news first. When God asks you to do something that does not make sense, he's about to reveal his name. When God asks you to do something that does not make sense to you, God wants to reveal his name. He is getting ready to let you see something that you have never seen before, something that you have never experienced before. Maybe you're between a rock and a hard place, and God is asking you to do something, and it does not make sense. Can I tell you this morning, he is getting ready to reveal himself, but listen to this, as long as we are obedient to him. Sometimes God asks us to do something that does not make sense, And he wants to see if we're going to be obedient before he reveals himself and shows up as Jehovah Jireh. We'll come back to that obedience here in just a moment. But somehow I am afraid, if we're not careful, that we get so fixated on our problems and the circumstances that we miss the test that God has for us. God tested Abraham But don't miss the test. What is the heart of the test that God was sending Abraham through? I believe when faced with a choice between the blessing and the blessor, he wants to know which one will we choose. Are we going to choose the blessing? Or are we going to choose the blessor? The blessing in Abraham's case was Isaac. The blessor was God himself, Jehovah Jireh. Because God is the one that gave them Isaac when it was humanly impossible for them to have a child. You see, Isaac was the blessing. And God had finally opened the door through miraculous interventions and gave them a blessing. Here's, I believe, our problem many times. We can so fall in love with a blessing that it trumps the blessor. We can fall in love with a blessing and forget about who gave us the blessing. Are you with me? How do you know this is the heart of the test? Because God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, notice this, in church. God says, Abraham, offer him up to me. That's worship. Offer the blessing back up to the blessor. And so for Abraham, it was a matter of worship. But here's the question. How do you worship when it hurts? Abraham left, and he was going to offer his only son Isaac. And God said, I want you to worship me there. But how do you worship when it hurts? Let's be honest, it's tough. It's tough to worship when it hurts. When we're asked to give up the blessing to the blessor, but it hurts so much because the blessing is something that we love so much. After all, it's not time to go to church when it hurts so bad, right? It's time to stay home. Brother Corey, you just don't know what I'm going through, so I believe I'm going to stay home. It's time to stay home and ask God why. Or go to everybody else and say, what's your opinion on this? Why did God allow this to happen instead of going and offering our blessing to the blessor? Many times we think, God, I I don't understand why you're allowing me to go through this test and this trial. What I'm going through does not make sense. 
But have you ever thought about this fact? That you are go- what you're going through, that thing that you're going through that does not make sense, God brought it, God allowed it in your life. But many times we don't see the fact that God has allowed it and God wants to reveal himself through the difficulties in our life. But so many times what we do is we get our eyes fixated on the problem, the burden, and we miss out on the blessing. And so we see the crisis of Abraham. But I want you to notice with me in verses 3 through 10, not only do we see the crisis of Abraham, but we see the compliance of Abraham. Notice with me in beginning in verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. And then notice then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Notice this and I'll stop here for a moment. He went three days journey. He went for three days. By the way, that's a long drive to worship. That's a long drive to go to church. But notice verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. You guys stay here. Me and the lad, we're going to go yonder, and we're going to worship. But notice the last phrase in verse 5. But we will come again unto you. We will come again unto you. Now, What do you mean, Abraham, by we will return to you? Abraham said, me and Isaac, we're going to return. God had just told Abraham to go and offer Isaac upon the altar as a sacrifice. In other words, go and kill your son. But when Abraham left, he says, we, me and the lad, we will return. So what did he mean by we'll return? I want to fast forward to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. Of course, the great hall of faith chapter. And I believe God allowed Abraham to see something in in Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and that he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And then he Almost the writer of Hebrews tells us what Abraham was thinking. He says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure which is a type. But when I go back to Genesis, Genesis 1 through 22, nobody had ever been raised from the dead. So what was Abraham saying that me and the lad, we're going to return? Nobody had ever been raised from the dead. There is no history of resurrection at this point in Genesis 22. So where did Abraham get this concept from where he had no reference? You see, a lot of times I believe God may send you through something that may not make sense to you. You may not have a point of reference. You may not know of anybody who's ever gone through that particular thing before. And that's when you say this. You say, I I don't know what I'm going through. Nobody's ever been through this before. But God, I trust you. Remember 20 to 25 years before this, Sarah's womb was dead. It was dead. There was no way physically possible that Sarah could ever have a baby. There's no way that Abraham could help Sarah have a baby. And so there were no markers for them. And all of a sudden comes along Isaac. (laughs) What a miraculous birth that was for Isaac to be born to Abraham and to Sarah. And I believe this is the reason why that you have to have markers in your life of what God has done in the past So that when you face something bigger in the future, you have a point of reference. You see, when God makes a problem bigger, it is because he wants to unveil himself larger. Many of you ladies heard my wife's testimony yesterday and 
And I'm so thankful that my wife could, uh, I'm so thankful that I could tag along with my wife, actually, uh, on this trip uh, and, uh, and come along with her as she spoke to the ladies yesterday at the ladies' conference. And many of you ladies heard her, her story. And, and I'll be honest with you, in these last five years of our family, we have seen God unveil himself in a very large way. We've seen God do some things in our family that we just have to say, wow, God, God, God showed up. God did it. And sometimes when God makes a problem bigger, it's because he wants to unveil himself larger. Same God, just a bigger problem. And that's the reason when people want to give up on God because it doesn't make sense, maybe it's not fair in our mind that that individual could be walking away from a larger manifestation or a larger blessing. You see, sometimes God allows your problems to be bigger so that he can unveil himself larger so that he can reveal himself and show up as Jehovah Jireh and say, my God will provide. Here Abraham is facing the trial of his life. Look with me, let's continue in verse 6. After Abraham said, we will come again unto you, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Can you imagine right now what's going through Abraham's mind? Here's the son that God promised me, and God, you told me to offer my son. But notice the willingness and the obedience of Abraham. And Isaac spake unto Abraham and said, Father, and his father said, Here am I, son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, and, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, and I love this, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so they went both of them together. Verse 9, And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And I could just imagine, see the picture here, as Abraham stretched forth his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. I want you to just picture it with me. Here's Abraham, his only son, laying there. He's got the wood, he's got the fire, and Isaac says, Daddy, but where is the, where's the sacrifice? Where is the lamb? And can you imagine the hurt that's going through Abraham's mind and heart right now? As Abraham takes that knife... That son that he had prayed for. And he takes that knife. And he sees his son laying there. And all of a sudden, Abraham is getting ready to bring the knife down on his own son. And all of a sudden, God shows up in the bottom of the ninth inning. And God shows up and the angel of the Lord says in verse 11... Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. And man, can you imagine right now what's going through Abraham's mind? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. But here he was, had the knife pulled, and was ready to bring it down on his son. When Jesus, I believe it was Jesus himself, an Old Testament manifestation of Jesus, shows up. And says, Abraham, no, you can lay the knife down. I want you to notice, finally, in verses 11 through 14, we see the crisis of Abraham. We see the compliance of Abraham. But I want you to see the contribution of Jehovah in these verses. Here God shows up in the bottom of the ninth inning. And in verse 12, the Bible says, And he says, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, For now, and I underline this in your Bible, if you underline in your Bible, for now I know that thou fearest God. Why now? Because he knew that Abraham was willing to do what he asked him to do, even what was thought to be ridiculous. 
What he thought in his mind, I cannot do. Abraham was willing to do it. And now the angel says, for now I know that thou fearest God. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in place in the stead of his son. Here there was a ram that was caught in a thicket. By the way, it was a mighty quiet ram. A mighty quiet ram until the ram was needed. Matter of fact, they say that, if you read after scholars, they say that the rams, if they're ever caught in a thicket, I mean, they're just, they're, they're crazy animals while they're in a thicket trying to get out of the thicket. But here the ram stays quiet. And the ram only makes the noise at the right time. And it's amazing how Abraham, he never hears the ram until he finished the command to obey. Abraham did not hear the ram in the thicket until Abraham finished the command to obey. Can I stop right here and let me make some application? Your answer could be sitting right next to you. You may be going through some difficulties, some problems. You may be facing a big obstacle in your life. And can I say to you this morning, your answer could be sitting right next to you. Your solution could be sitting right next to you. But you will never know it until you finish complying to the command that God has given to us. Here it is. While God was going up one side of the mountain, he had a ram coming up the other side. And he was going to create a match at just the right time. And God supplieth the answer. The answer was there. The answer was right beside Abraham. But God had not revealed it yet. You see, God did not reveal the answer to Abraham's crisis until Abraham obeyed and fully obeyed. And all of a sudden, Jesus, Jehovah, shows up in the bottom of the ninth inning. But I want you to notice very quickly something that jumped out to me in verse 14 is this. He named the place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I believe Abraham discovered something about Jehovah that day that I believe if we would discover this morning, if we would get a hold of this thought that it could change our life because we will look at our circumstances and our difficulties and our problems totally differently. And so I want you to take a look at the word gyra. Gyra. The root word for gyra means to see beforehand. To see beforehand. He names the place the Lord will provide gyra. The word gyra could also be translated provide. To see beforehand and also provide. So what is the relationship between the root word, to see beforehand, and the translation of the word, which means to provide? Let me give you another word that may bring these two together. It's the word provision. Provision. Vision means to see. Provision means that I provided something. And even in the word provision, it means that I provided something, but I also saw something. In other words, I addressed what I saw. Are you following me? God provides based on his prevision. Prevision leads to provision. So the question is this, what must God see so that he might provide? What does God have to see for Jireh to show up? When what you're going through does not make sense and is not fair, what must God see in us so that you can name the place, the mess that you're in, Jehovah Jireh, so that you can see God break through in a way that you did not plan on 
and you must have to say, this is Jehovah Jireh. So what did God see before Jehovah Jireh showed up? Prevision leads to provision. And so what God had to see before he provided the ram in the thicket, he had to see complete obedience from Abraham. And that's the picture that I want you to see this morning. And notice what God saw in verse 3. He saw immediate obedience. As soon as God gave Abraham the command, Abraham didn't whine and complain. Abraham didn't fuss with God about it. Notice what he said in verse 3. He rose up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took up these two young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Complete, immediate obedience. We all understand delayed obedience becomes immediate disobedience. If God says to do something... If God tells us to do something and we're thinking about it or considering it, there's nothing for God to see. There's nothing for Jireh. There's nothing for God to see because we have not acted upon what he said. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. What if Abraham had only gone up halfway of the mountain? What would have happened? he would not have finished the journey. Maybe Abraham could have said, well, at least God, give me credit for going halfway up. Lord, give me credit for getting dressed. Give me credit for getting the donkeys and saddling the donkeys. But God did not ask Abraham to get up and to saddle his donkey. He said, go up to the mountain, and I want you to sacrifice your son. You see, what we want is delayed obedience and partial obedience with full-time manifestations and full-time blessings. We want the full-time blessings of God with partial obedience. We want the full-time blessings of God with partial obedience. Can I tell you this morning, if you can trust God with your eternity... How many of you trust God with your eternity this morning? If you can trust God with your eternity, don't you think you can trust God in the very details of your life? No matter what God sends your way, don't you think that you can trust Him? Don't you think you can trust Him with your time? If you can trust him with eternity, don't you think you can trust him with your time? Are you willing to trust God with your Isaac? That thing that you love the most. You see, that's where God was trying to get Abraham to the point where he was willing to sacrifice and give up what he loved the most, and that was Isaac. Can I remind you this morning, God wants to send great blessings. He wants to open up the windows of heaven and pour down his blessings upon you and your family and this ministry and thank God for the blessings that he's already poured out. But can I remind you this morning, he wants to continue to pour out blessings to you, to your family, to this ministry. But he will only do it with full obedience, with immediate obedience that thing that you wanted to release the least, that thing that means the most to you, that Isaac, the thing that you're holding on tight to and you don't want to let go, that Isaac in your life. By the way, we all have an Isaac in our life. We all have an Isaac in our life that we're afraid to turn loose of. We don't want to give over to God. But you see what God saw in Abraham? He saw that God mattered to Abraham more than Isaac. By the way, he didn't stop loving Isaac. But he loved God more. And it was proven in his actions in Genesis 22. Loving God does not mean having an emotional attachment. It means obedience to God through our actions. I believe one of the reasons maybe that we have not experienced 
Jehovah Jireh like we need to. It's because God is still waiting upon us to act on what he's told us to do. Maybe we've obeyed partially, but not totally, not fully. You see, Isaac had to be placed on the altar. Isaac had to literally be placed on the altar. And when God said in verse 12, Now I know that thou fearest me, then and only then did the solution show up, even though the solution was right next to him. The solution was right there in the thicket, and Abraham didn't know it. Could it be that God would have given to us in five minutes the thing that we've been waiting for and wanting for and desiring to have for all these years if we would have had immediate and complete obedience? But Jehovah Jireh is not going to show up until you put your Isaac on the altar. I don't know who I may be talking to this morning. I don't know what your Isaac may be in your life. But Jehovah Jireh is not going to show up until you put your Isaac on the altar. Maybe you're single here today and your desire for a mate could be so strong that it calls you not to follow the Lord completely as a single. And he could have that person that God wants for you sitting right next to you and you never see it because the thing that he wants, you don't want to give it to him. It could be this morning that in your marriage relationship that you want God to do something in, but you are not willing to give up that thing that you're holding on to. By the way, it could be money. Maybe you're thinking this morning, God, I I would give you that portion of my finances that I'm supposed to give to you. I'll give it to you, God, after you meet this need. I'll give it to you, God, after you give me more. But can I remind you, that's not what God asks us to do. By the way, if that's our attitude, God says you're going to be waiting for a long, long time. A long time. Because God wants to know that we trust him enough to worship him, to honor him with the first fruits of what he gives to us and not what we have left over. It could be that finances is your Isaac. He wants us to put it on the altar. It could be that our career is our Isaac. Maybe we don't understand how how we're going to make it, how it's all going to work out. But this is what you said, and so here it is. And you say, God, I trust you with it. God, I don't understand. But God, I trust you with it. If you don't get anything else, I want you to get this statement this morning. You cannot hold on to Isaac and get Jehovah Jireh. You cannot hold on to your Isaac, whatever that Isaac may be in your life. You cannot hold on to Isaac and get Jehovah Jireh. You see, what our problem is, we want Isaac and Jehovah Jireh. We want that thing that we love the most, and we want Jehovah Jireh to show up in our life. But you can't have it. Because it's when he sees that he provides. Prevision, then comes provision. God wants to see that we're willing to give up our Isaac, and then Jehovah Jireh will show up. By the way, when you see Jairus shows up, show up, what happens? I want to kind of close with this thought. Back in Hebrews chapter 11, he got back Isaac, the Bible says, as a type or a figure. He got him back physically, but a type is something that foreshadows something else, something greater, something bigger, something larger than what the type is. So Abraham gets back Isaac Plus, stay with me here for just a couple minutes and I'm done. What does he give him? Notice Genesis 22 in verses 16 through 18. And he said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thine son, thine only son, and notice this, 
that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And thy seed, and in thy seed shall all, notice this, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Because what? Because thou hast obeyed my voice. God says, I'm going to give you your Isaac back, but that is nothing compared to what I'm going to give you. He tells Abraham that he hasn't seen nothing yet. He says, Abraham, I'm about to open up the windows of heaven, and I'm going to show you some things that will have generational repercussions. And in saving Isaac, you can keep Isaac and lose everything else. But because you are willing to put Isaac on the altar and sacrifice Isaac, you get Isaac back plus everything else. Here's the problem. Many are trading Isaac and everything else in order to keep Isaac. The thing that they love the most. But if all you have is Isaac, that is limited. Again, Isaac is just a type of God unleashing all that God has for you. But God wants to know that he has you before he unleashes everything. In other words, he wants to know that the blesser is more important than the blessing. By the way, everybody goes to church looking for the blessing. Everybody goes to church. Go on, Pastor Corey, won't you bless me? Everybody goes to church looking for the blessing, and if we're not careful, the blessing will trump the blessor. Notice Genesis 22, verse 14. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen or provided. He tells you where he provides. Where is he going to provide? In the mount of the Lord. By the way, he does not just provide just any old time. He provides again when there's complete obedience and a specific location in the mount. Can I ask you, what is the mount? It was Mount Moriah, the place of worship. He says, you must look at Isaac as an opportunity to worship. And when you worship over your Isaac to exalt the Lord, you make it a matter of worship and God makes your provision. It's in the mountain. It's part of your worship. Making it your worship is when he provided. It's when he made the sacrifice that Jehovah Jireh showed up. I'm reminded in John chapter 8, verse 56, the Lord is talking to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees doing their normal thing, and they're condemning Jesus. And Jesus makes this statement to the unbelieving Jews, and he said this in verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. And was glad. Jesus Christ was claiming to be God, and he tells them, Let me tell you how long that I have been around. Abraham saw my day. That's how long I've been around. Abraham saw me, and he was glad. Back in Genesis, the Bible says that Abraham was walking and he lifted up his eyes. And can I remind you, Mount Moriah is just a couple hundred yards away from Golgotha. The mount where Jesus was crucified. But Abraham not only saw Mount Moriah, but I believe he saw something else. In John 8, 56, the Bible says he saw the Lord's day. He saw that one day that God was going to enter into human history in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was going to come and make provisions, the word provisions for the sins of mankind. And he was going to become our Jehovah Jireh. And he was going to provide. So what God says to the angel, the angel of the Lord did for Abraham, he was still doing today. Just as Isaac was put on the altar, the Lord Jesus Christ was also put on the altar. Just as Isaac 
was giving back to Abraham, the Lord Jesus is giving back to his children, making intercession for them. He's in heaven right now. And can I tell you, he wants to be your Jehovah Jireh. He wants to show up in a great way. And he wants to provide and meet your needs. And he's in heaven right now, waiting to provide for you, to bless you, to deliver you. But this is the only thing he's waiting for. He's waiting for you to give up your Isaac. To lay your Isaac on the altar. To free him up so that he can show you what Calvary can do in your messed up situation in your life. If I had time to tell you today, I I would tell you what Paul said in Ephesians 3.20. He's able to exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or think. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. God is able. God wants to show up in your life. Jehovah Jireh wants to show up in your life. But he's not going to show up until you bring your Isaac to the altar. God wants to bless you. God wants to meet your needs. I I don't care. I, I, I don't know what your crisis may be today. I don't know what you may be going through. But can I tell you, Jehovah Jireh wants to show up. Provision will be there, but there's got to be prevision. And God wants you to lay your Isaac on the altar and have complete obedience and say, God, here's my Isaac. And when you do, I don't care how bad it may be in your life, when you put your Isaac on the altar, it may be the bottom of the ninth inning, it may be an overtime And you may be wondering if I'm going to win this thing or not. And can I tell you, Jehovah Jireh will show up at just the right time. As long as you'll bring your Isaac to the altar. Would you stand with me?